want to start off a little bit and just give you my little story, if you haven't heard it before. You know, why do surgeons innovate? I think Sages is a great example of why surgeons innovate. If you look at all the booths downstairs, many of those devices began with surgeons needing a new tool for surgery. So I'm going to just share my example because not only do surgeons need to innovate, they have to understand how to innovate safely within regulations of the FDA and how to actually, once you innovate, you have to understand the business of what's going on. So you realize that just because you have a device, you still have to get it to the market and you have to be able to support that device when you're at the market. So I'll start off a little bit about my story. Uh, and full disclosure, as we all do, part of my story is the fact that my university, myself, and a whole team of us at our hospital developed this device. So in full disclosure, Synapse Biomedical is the marketing arm for the device. And it really comes down to when I went to Case Western Reserve 15 years ago and I was looking for a research project, Tom Mortimer, who's an electrical engineer and biomedical engineer at Case Western Reserve, had this little idea to help people on ventilators. <clears throat> so chronic mechanical ventilation, if you're a spinal cord injured patient, you get put on a ventilator, saves your life, otherwise you're dead. But mechanical ventilators have huge problems. It costs up to $200,000 a year to be on a ventilator. Difficulty with speech, every aspect of your life changes if you're on a ventilator. Short battery problems, we actually, after Hurricane Katrina, I think I had one of the first publications uh, talking about ventilator problems in Hurricane Katrina as opposed to other devices that are available for patients. Um, there's a huge problem with being on a ventilator. Number one problem, though, is you won't live as long. If you're on a ventilator, you will die from pneumonia eventually. So we actually began looking at ways to get around that. And the objectives of the program was really to provide natural negative pressure ventilation with the patient's own diaphragm. Now, and many of you may recall that Glenn out of Yale developed a phrenic nerve system in the late 1960s. It actually even goes back, the first description of electrophrenic respiration was in the 1800s. After some um, people were actually put to death, they tried with the advent of electricity to revive them by stimulating the diaphragm. So the people thought that you lived based on your diaphragm applications. So electrophrenic respiration has been described in the medical literature since the 1800s. I don't know how they got that published with IRB and problems of taking freshly dead people and trying to revive them, but they published it. But we wanted to realize that nobody actually got the phrenic nerve system. Uh, the reason for that is when you actually directly stimulate a nerve, you risk injuring the nerve. And one aspect about diaphragm pacing is if you injure the nerve or cut the nerve, you can never stimulate the muscle distal to that. We wanted to provide it with limited risk and problems, inexpensive outpatient management and removable. And obviously as a laparoscopic surgeon, we want to do it with laparoscopy. So this is about 16, 17 years ago when we began this process. Now really when laparoscopy was becoming more common. So instead of a thoracotomy, we wanted to do this laparoscopically. And, and really it comes down to how do we breathe? And this is the basis of all of our research is that I can make my diaphragm move by thinking about it. <clears throat> But most of us actually have in our deep brain stem the special somatic nuclei, the prebots complex that controls our respiration at night. So if you're a spinal cord injured patient, you've lost your ability to breathe because you have a disconnection between your brain stem and C3, 4, and 5, your motor neurons that control the diaphragm. You then have a phrenic nerve. And a lot of our data now is about the diaphragm physiology. How can we keep that muscle going and by stimulating it? So what occurred, and this is actually the history of research, as we all know, takes a long time. Um, my initial IDE application was in 1992. And it's interesting because we were finally audited by the FDA when we got market approval in 2008. It was one of the oldest IDEs, and the rules from 1992 till 2008 are completely different. We never changed the IDE, though. So we, we, this went on forever with the FDA. We got it approved in 1994. We actually got our IRB approved this in 1996. We hadn't even manufactured any of the devices yet. And so the process is very long. And obviously, um, everything that we built at that time period was just built by graduate students in our graduate labs, postdocs, PhDs, masters, no quality control. And in the year 2000, 10 years ago, we implanted the first patient and it actually worked. Three months later, this guy who had been on a ventilator for three years is off the ventilator. But it's very interesting because once we did that first implant, things changed a little bit because we had a little time to get to the second implant. So my professor, Mortimer, who actually you know, had all these graduate students, he retired. All of a sudden, the free labor was gone. You know? And actually, rules changed. Actually, um, my university didn't realize that they now produced the life support device 
And they were allegedly the manufacturer of record for life support devices. And universities don't like that. The FDA actually doesn't like if you just build life support devices in your research lab. So we actually had to find somebody to build its device. Obviously, I don't know if anybody realizes there's no money in spinal cord injured patients. There's only 300 new patients a year. So we went and talked to Medtronic. Hey, why don't you build this device? And everybody said, walked away. So we actually decided, myself and an engineer I hired, we need to just form our own company. So we formed Synapse Biomedical in the year 2002. By 2003, we had one employee. And obviously, as you can see there, the second patient we ever implanted was Superman, Christopher Reeve. So we decided to go for all the money. And you'd probably never hear about diaphragm pacing if, if he died on the operating room table or something. But um, you know, even he said in his book, he says, what do I have to lose? I'm a quadriplegic on a ventilator. This is laparoscopy. And as we're all surgeons here, laparoscopy is easy. I mean, it's very easy if you're already on a ventilator. My anesthesiologist realized pretty quickly this is like the easiest case they do. You just put them back on the ventilator afterwards. We wean them at a later date. Uh, we did various business plan competitions. And many of you that may have had devices and ideas, you know, we um, wrote a business plan. We know our hospital administrators always ask about a business plan, you know, if you're doing a new hernia or something. But we actually won a lot of money in business plan competitions. We got a lot of input. I mean, we actually won hard cash of $100,000 through various competitions that actually began the process. And obviously, we had orphan disease um, grant from the FDA. It's very interesting. People didn't realize that even though you're doing research, you need product liability. And people don't realize the FDA paid our product liability through the orphan disease device. It's a very small program, and they allow you to use the money as we work through this and getting this device into patients. And obviously, you have to have some angel investors that, you know, all these things will be kind of outlined a little bit later in people's talks. And this is what we devised. is actually a suction cup mapping electrode various patents on that. That's version, I think, four or five that you're seeing there utilizing it, where we actually map the diaphragm, and then we'll implant these electrodes in the diaphragm. And actually, this is a little implant instrument that we developed. And you'll see the small electrode there. And this is one aspect about devices um, that actually, in the early 90s, our universities weren't as involved in getting patents as they are now and worried about royalties. And what we found is that I don't know if that second video will come up or not. But either way, that small electrode that you see there, uh, one of my graduate students called Peterson developed that electrode and actually published it before anybody got the patent on it. It's a great electrode, probably the key aspect of our device, but that electrode, which we utilize in all of our applications, there's no patent on it. Now, we slowly found out that only one person ever made that electrode, and he's now employed by our company. And so, and there's a very special secret wire winder to make that electrode that the only two ever built, we now have, we own in our company. And as you develop these things, you realize that if you miss an early intellectual property, it may affect you for a long period of time. And then actually, it's an external device, a percutaneous device. And we actually worked with many people to try to make it implantable, but for a small market, it didn't make financial sense. And we could actually program this, and every spinal cord injured patient we implant, we get off the ventilator. But that required uh, ID study and to get FDA approval, which can take a while, as we all know. And so we had to transition from a research to a medical device. And obviously, there's large amounts of paperwork. I always like to show in the side. And I, when my auditor came here, this is my paperwork of a single IDE since 1992. And even the FDA had lost like all of their paperwork from 92 to 98 when they finally audited us in 2008. They didn't even, you know, we're giving them the documents so they can bring back to their office. Because it was just, there's a lot of IDs that just go away, but this one just lingered on, and we never redid the initial paperwork. And obviously, we uh, developed this clean room, which is better when we look at that, what we used to build these devices, and then just sterilize them in our autoclave and then implant them. Um, you know, a clean room that we got on eBay for our company, a nice little story of what you can buy on eBay. And then obviously we developed a, a manufacturing plant. And actually, in a <laughs> and it's interesting, and actually uh, you may hear eerie of how we found this. This actually was an old seed plant. The FDA actually also controls manufacturing of seeds and stuff, and actually that company went bankrupt, so there was a space for us that actually fit all the criteria for a manufacturing plant. So this is where I used to get your, your Berkeley seeds is in this plant in Northeast Ohio that we now build and, and send things around the country in that regard. But there's actually a, a lot of aspects when you have a small device. One, it worked in the spinal cord. Tiny market, 300 new patients a year. You know, it's maybe a three to five million dollar market. No company would invest in that. But all of a sudden, ALS, there's 5,200 patients in ALS. And early on, we had an angel donor that donated me money to start the process for my IDE application for ALS. So I at least had a little bit more knowledge about IDEs when we began this process. 
And actually, we just opened up our database in September, and our application is in the FDA. And this is very interesting, because as surgeons, we now have the best therapy for ALS. We extend lives for about 18 months. Now, when you design an IDE trial, and the ALS data changed, because ALS, there's no biomarkers, and we actually wanted to do a decrease in the decline of the force vital capacity was our primary endpoint. And I'm sure uh, Dr. Luke may talk about this a little bit. Our secondary endpoint was survival. Most trials, when you want to get faster aspects, you begin earlier. And actually, our secondary endpoint is great, but we weren't allowed to elevate our secondary endpoint to our primary endpoint for a PMA application. So instead, for an orphan disease, we're going to HUD, HDE, area for marketing or at least having it approved in the United States under that special FDA program until we continue onward. We actually also realized, again, look at the size, over 100,000 uh, tracheostomies are done for ferry to wean in the ICU. So our technology, we realized very rapidly that we could actually change ventilator management in the ICU. I tried during the pandemic scare, I actually tried to get pandemic money. Uh, obviously the vaccine companies got all the money, not the medical device company. It's kind of hard for them to see how we could actually change that. And as many of you know, we can actually use notes, natural orifice. We can actually implant this entire system at the bedside in the ICU at the time of a PEG, which would actually simplify the surgical procedure as opposed to laparoscopy. So we've been looking at all those aspects for this type of applications. And this is actually the key thing about diaphragm dysfunction is a New England Journal article from two years ago showing how rapidly the diaphragm atrophies. Here's our animal data showing how we can overcome the use of a ventilator in the ICU with temporary diaphragm pacing electrodes, which again reaches a much larger market size. And mechanical ventilation or ventilator induced diaphragm dysfunction leads to a lot of problems. Within 12 hours of being on the ventilator, you use 50, lose 50% 50 of your diaphragm mass. So we've shown with diaphragm pacing, we can overcome that loss of muscle mass. And also in the intensive care unit, by pacing using your diaphragm, you actually ventilate the posterior lobes so you get rid of atelectasis and pneumonias. So it's a huge change in the management of the ICU. Here's a, one of our patients. We're doing a fairly early spinal cord injured patients, right lower lobe pneumonia. Obviously, this is a patient. One day after pacing, you change the entire ventilation because we can selectively drive the right diaphragm and actually get rid of atelectasis and pneumonias. So we can actually control that very rapidly by utilizing diaphragm muscle as opposed to positive pressure ventilation. But obviously, you know, from being involved in initial ID where it's just me and a couple other people, researchers just finding a neat research project so I could get promoted to actually developing and founding a company, Synapse Biomedical, and I think raising $7.2 million of venture capital over the years. But there's venture capital pressures, obviously. Once you go that route, you're like, you've made that deal with the devil almost because um, you have a, a new person involved. And actually, at some point in time, they say, there's no money in spinal cord and ALS. Once we saw our data for ICU, I mean, the dollar signs just boom, boom. All of a sudden, you got 100,000 procedures at a bare minimum. It changes your, your entire company focus. But and I, as I'm from Cleveland, Ohio, and it's always common is you can't have a high-tech company in Cleveland, and it, you know, they want you to move to California. It's like once a year, well, if you were in California, it'd be much better. You know, I have no idea what they're talking about. And then there's university pressures. Um, recently, my university, you know, almost wanted to take back the patents because they're not making enough royalties. They want to resell the two key patents to a different company for the high price aspects, the acute pacing, everybody. And so all of a sudden, we're, we're like, well, you're losing your focus as a university. And obviously, as we always know, conflict of interest. So obviously, as a surgeon in planning this device uh, in a university where we all have a conflict of interest, there's a lot of issues. But we've actually worked through it quite well at my university where... For orphan diseases, you know, they, you know, for the acute applications, I probably will not do the research at my own university. And then obviously there's economic pressures. From our initial business plan in 2002, our last round of financing would be the second and third quarter of 2008. And we all know what happened then. We we're going to raise the big money for that acute trial, 10 to $20 million, and really just go gangbusters. But obviously, um, when you have your business plan and you know you're going to be running out of money and then the economy collapses, we ran out of money. I laid off half of our employees. At one point in time, we had 22 full-time employees at this, so we had to refocus on that and actually laid off half the employees, and we survived 2009. We actually, as a small device company with only one market application that's a nonprofit application under the HCE program, we actually were in the black barely last year, but we were in the black. So we survived the struggles of startup companies. So these are all aspects that we're going to try to discuss during this lunch here. Um, but why do we innovate? 
And this is the key, I think, because surgeons, actually, we still face our patients. So this is actually my first child we ever implanted a year ago. Off and this is Sunday, Houston, March the 23rd. And it's in the 50s, but Woo! <laughs> how's that fresh air smell, Alice? Awesome. Pull it in. Oh, baby. Pull it in through your nose, buddy. So he was injured four years ago as a six-year-old on a ventilator, lived in rural Ohio, actually hadn't seen a doctor in four years. Um, and it's very interesting because you can they really change their entire life once you get a child off a ventilator. They can go back to school. Any patient that gets off a ventilator, it's life-changing technology. And obviously this is what some of our other patients did if this video comes up. There's a reason young males break their necks. We can stop that video now. His landing isn't as good. Um, <laughs> um, I was in the Air Force for 13 years, and if you're doing a tandem skydive, as uh, the guy in the bottom should not land on the ground first, especially if you're quadriplegic. Um, so this is kind of the overview I wanted to give, at least in my personal experience. I, I think this whole aspect of industry and surgeons perhaps not being allowed to work together, I think every surgeon I know is still in it for the patients. And so you have to really work with our patients as we do this. And so with this uh, as kind of a brief you know, description of what we're trying to go over today, I'll now introduce our next speaker, who's Dr. Dennis Fowler, who's actually um, Professor of Clinical Surgery at Columbia. He's been involved in multiple devices over the years. He's going to kind of talk a little bit about how the NIH can do help with device development.